Good evening and welcome to this Center for Brooklyn History talk. Tonight we focus on the legacy of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg with four truly remarkable guests. I want to thank all of you for joining us at this particular moment when as a nation we're considering the primacy of our democratic laws and institutions in ways that were inconceivable just a few days ago. Before introducing our distinguished experts, let me introduce myself and tell you just a little bit about the Center for Brooklyn History. I'm Marcia Eli, Director of Programs at the Center, which is a part of the Brooklyn Public Library. Every week we offer free public programs like this one through the library's programming arm, BPL Presents. We have many topical evenings coming up. In the next few weeks, we'll be discussing fascism, the fraught relationship between America and Iran. And at the end of January is BPL Presents Always Provocative Night of Philosophy and Ideas. Um, I hope that you will explore some of these and perhaps join us. I also have two quick notes to share. First, in a moment, we will put in the chat a link to a book that beautifully supports tonight's conversation. It's titled Decisions and Dissents of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and is edited by tonight's moderator, Corey Brett Schneider. That link will allow you to purchase the book locally at the community bookstore in Brooklyn in support of our borough's small businesses. I also wanna invite all of you to join this conversation by sharing your questions. Simply type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And now it is my true honor to tell you about and welcome one accomplished guest after another. Fatima Goss Graves is president and CEO of the National Women's Law Center. She is a co-founder of the Times Up Legal Defense Fund, which connects <clears throat> those who experience sexual misconduct in the workplace with legal and other assistance. She regularly testifies before Congress and federal agencies and speaks or is quoted frequently as a legal expert on <clears throat> issues core to women's lives for the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, CNN, NMS, MSNBC, PBS, and NPR. Welcome and thank you for being here. I'm so glad to be here, thank you. Kate Shaw is professor of law at Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law and co-director of the Florsheimer Center for Constitutional Democracy. Before joining Cardozo, she worked in the Obama White House Counsel's Office as a special assistant to the president and associate counsel to the president. She clerked for Justice John Paul Stevens of the US Supreme Court and Judge Richard A. Posner of the US Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. She edited the 2019 book, Reproduction Rights and Justice Stories with Reva Siegel and Melissa Murray, our next panelist. And she serves as a contributor with ABC News, co-hosts the Supreme Court podcast, Strict Scrutiny, and serves as a public member of the Administrative Conference of the United States. Welcome. Thanks, Marcia, great to be here. Melissa Murray is Frederick I. and Grace Stoke Professor of Law at NYU Law and Faculty Director of Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network. Her research focuses on the legal regulation of sex and sexuality. She is an author of Cases on Reproductive Rights and Justice and has published in the New York Times, Newsweek, Vanity Fair, shared commentary on NPR, MSNBC, and PBS. She clerked for Sonia Sotomayor, then of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, and Stefan Underhill of the U.S. District Court for the District of Connecticut. Prior to joining the NYU faculty, she was on the faculty of the University of California Berkeley School of Law, where for a year she served as interim dean. Thank you for being here, Melissa Murray. Thanks for having me. And tonight's moderator is Corey Brettschneider professor of political science at Brown University where he teaches constitutional law and political theory. His recent writing has appeared in the New York Times, Politico and the Washington Post. His books include The Oath and the Office, A Guide to the Constitution for Future Presidents 
When the state speaks, what should it say? How democracies can protect expression and promote equality? And democratic rights, the substance of self-government. He is the editor of the book series, Penguin Liberty, which includes the volume of Justice Ginsburg's writings, which I just mentioned. And his constitutional law casebook is widely used in classrooms throughout the United States. Thank you for being here, Corey. Thank you all. And I turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And thanks to the center and the organizers of this terrific event. Of course, we're living in a, a worrying time, in some ways a dark time, but I think the, the hope of tonight's event is that by really looking at the legacy and the life of one of the most important litigators and Supreme Court justices to live when it comes to her legacy, as you'll see, especially in areas like equal protection of the law, um, uh, that we'll have some hope that comes out of this. Uh, of course, uh, there is a lot of attention paid to the uh, life of uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, a film, feature film, a documentary, but what we're really gonna do is take you through on a tour uh, of the cases that she influenced both as a litigator and then uh, as a Supreme Court justice. And one of the striking things about Ruth Bader Ginsburg's life uh, uh, that makes her really comparable to the most important litigators and justices of all time. Really, there is one person she's most often compared to, and that's Thurgood Marshall. Uh, not just because they were both terrific Supreme Court justices, but because they both shaped the law, both as litigators, uh, arguing cases, uh, and then had an opportunity, a rare opportunity to, as a justice, uh, to shape the law as well. The same areas of law uh, that they had so influenced. Of course, for Thurgood Marshall, uh, it was through his work with the Civil Rights Commission during the Truman administration and then during Brown versus Board of Education that he shaped uh, a fundamental, maybe the most fundamental case uh, in uh, the history of equal protection. Uh, and then as a Supreme Court justice going on to continue to shape that area of law. As you'll see, Justice Ginsburg has a parallel. She's a litigator, an influential one in the area of equal protection, and then starts to shape that same area of law uh, in uh, seminal cases, including we'll talk today about the, the case involving the Virginia Military Institute. So let's start with Justice Ginsburg as a litigator and talk about really um, uh, one of the first cases that she's involved with. Uh, she's a law professor at this time at Rutgers uh, Law School and also working with the ACLU. Uh, and this is a case known as Reed versus Reed. Uh, it's about a will. It's also about a totally egregious law. At the time, laws like this were common and accepted that blatantly discriminated against women. And there was thought to be no constitutional problem with them. She saw this law and found this uh, litigant uh, and decided to do something about it. Um, it involves uh, a law in which, uh, uh, in matters of um, uh, being in charge of a will, uh, uh, just in a blunt way, men were to be preferred uh, to women. Uh, so let's start with that. And Melissa, I'm going to turn to you and just ask you, what's the significance of this case? It's, of course, an egregious law. Supreme Court strikes it down. But what's the deeper significance, both of the way she argued it and the way to understand what the court did here in the development of the of the area of equal protection for women. Thanks, Corey. Um, let me first say a little bit about Reed versus Weed. As, as Corey says, this was a standard probate case in which the state of Idaho had a presumption in favor of male executors of intestate estates. And it was actually an unremarkable law. Many jurisdictions had similar kinds of laws um, throughout the country. There were laws that preferred men to women for certain things, whether it was jury duty or whatnot, on the ground that women were preoccupied with a life of the home, child rearing, wifedom and whatnot, and could not be um, taken away from those tasks because of public facing roles like jury duty or becoming an executor of a will. So at the time, the legal landscape was one where these sorts of laws were truly unremarkable and replete. And so Justice Ginsburg, um, as a litigator and facing them down, really faced an uphill battle. These were naturalized and normalized in the legal landscape. And she was really working to sort of disrupt what they look like. Um, it's important to understand here the kind of legal scaffolding that surrounds this case. Um, it's an equal protection case. Um, the equal protection clause guarantees each individual equal protection of the laws. And it's typically 
deployed in the service of reviewing laws that classify on a particular basis. And laws that classify are a dime a dozen, like legislatures always classify between different groups of individuals. But for equal protection purposes, the means by which they classify are really important. Under equal protection doctrine, there were at the time two levels of scrutiny by which laws could be reviewed. Strict scrutiny, which was applied to those laws that classified on the basis of race, national origin, or alienage. And then there was rational basis review for all other laws. The question that Ginsburg was really probing in Reed versus Reed was, what kind of standard of review should be applied in circumstances where the law was classifying on the basis of gender. And she argued that we should understand gender-based classifications in the same way that we understand race-based classifications. The idea here was that a gender-based classification like a race-based classification served no purpose other than to stigmatize the individual. And in making that analogy to race, she really drew upon the work of African-American legal scholar, Polly Murray, who has really um, been undersung in our legal history. But Polly Murray um, wrote an article, Jane Crow and the Law, in which she argued that all of these laws throughout the country that discriminated on the basis of gender were very much like the Jim Crow laws that had been dismantled by the court through the work of Thurgood Marshall and litigators at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And so when Ginsburg made these arguments, arguing that race and gender should be understood as coextensive, she was really drawing on Polly Murray, so much so that she actually listed Murray as an author on the she called the grandmother brief in Reed versus Reed. And those legal arguments that she offered in Reed versus Reed would be the basis for the rest of the litigation strategy that she and the Women's Rights Project of the ACLU would then lead throughout the rest of the 1970s. Great, and uh, let's get a little bit into the weeds. Um, as as you, you noted, the Equal Protection Clause was at the time fundamentally thought to protect um, uh, against uh, discrimination, certain, certainly invidious discrimination in regard to race. And historically, the, the, the thought at the time was uh, both that that was the point of the clause, the history of the clause is that it's um, passed by the radical Republican, co radical Republican Congress after the Civil War. And another thought I think was, well, there's no analogy here because men and women are different. And maybe there is not that same kind of difference when it comes to um, uh, matters of, of race. There isn't a biological difference, for instance. So uh, maybe we could open up the question of how, how did she go about changing that way of thinking and then how does she start to, um, or how does it go, I should say, when it comes to trying to say that there really is a close analogy between race and gender? Because she certainly starts out trying to do that and the court goes with her to some degree, but not all the way. So maybe somebody could uh, take it from there and, and, and uh, talk to us ab about the weeds of, you know, does she succeed in the full analogy or partially succeed? And uh, what do we think of that? I'm happy to jump in, uh, Corey, if that, if that works just for, and maybe I'll say uh, just a word about the framing of the 14th Amendment, which as you say, is a post-Civil War amendment, um, you know, designed and crafted with the eradication of discrimination on the basis of race in mind. Um, but, you know, the prehistory of the 14th Amendment, there was a moment when it actually, there were early women's rights activists who were pushing and hoping to actually include, you know, expansive language within the 14th Amendment that would more clearly prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex as well as race. And not only was it unsuccessful, the 14th Amendment actually ends up writing the words male and he into the Constitution for the first time. So not only are women not explicitly protected in at least the text, uh, the four corners of the text of the 14th Amendment, uh, but in a way, you know, visions of sex equality actually take a step back, uh, at least in the way that the language is framed. Um, that is not an obstacle, I think, as, as justice, as then litigator Ruth Bader Ginsburg sees it, the Constitution's guarantees uh, mean more than the specific, you know, intentions or circumstances surrounding uh, their crafting, but I think it is an interesting historical point to raise. Um, so by the time she is, you know, literally trying to kind of write equality and sex equality into the Constitution or, or find a place for it in the Constitution, you know, we have by this point the 19th Amendment, which prohibits, you know, discrimination in voting on the basis of sex, but isn't a broad prohibition on discrimination outside of the context of voting, although, you know, scholars, people like Reva Siegel have suggested that more than simply casting a vote uh, was contemplated and is encompassed within the 19th Amendment. Um, 
But so she's, you know, essentially lodging within the 14th Amendment this possibility of sex equality. Um, and she's sort of continuing this campaign. So she's, you talked about Reed versus Reed. So Frontiero versus Richardson is probably the next big important case to talk about. Um, and that's the case in which um, she's arguing as amicus on, on behalf of the ACLU. Um, and it, it, Melissa, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm right. Reed, she writes the brief, but I think Frontiero is the first case she actually argues before the court. Um, and, you know, so Melissa and I, I think, Marcia said at the outset, we co-host along with Leah Littman, a podcast about the Supreme Court. So we listen to a lot of Supreme Court arguments. Um, but if you don't, um, they're back to about 1955, the audio for all Supreme Court arguments is available on the OYE website, oyez.com. Um, and it's really fun to listen to old oral arguments and all of, you know, then Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the litigators arguments are available to listen to. So you could just pull up and listen to the Frontier versus Richardson argument, for example. Um, but right there, she is pressing the argument that some kind of heightened scrutiny and, and you know, really strict scrutiny um, should be brought to bear on laws that distinguish on the basis of sex. And here you had Sharon Richardson was, an, was um, a, a lieutenant, oh, sorry, in the Air Force. I was trying to remember where in the military she was. She was a lieutenant in the Air Force. Um, and there was at the time a spousal benefit. So men who were in the military were entitled to some additional pay uh, to support their wives. Um, but she was not entitled to that additional pay to support her dependent husband. And she challenged that. Um, and again, argued and Ginsburg argued uh, that those kinds of distinctions should be subject to strict scrutiny. And she got close <laughs> to convincing the court to side with her. Um, so she won, so Sharon, Sharon Richardson won the case um, uh, and won it 8-1, but Justice Brennan wrote for just a four member plurality, essentially endorsing um, the strict scrutiny vision that Justice, again, that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the litigator brought to the court um, and couldn't quite get a fifth vote and so could not enshrine within the law, the proposition that these distinctions were subject to strict scrutiny. And there's a backstory here in part, I think it's the case that the fact that the justices saw that the Equal Rights Amendment was on its way to ratification in the states as this case was pending before the court seemed to supply for some of the justices reasons to hesitate before fundamentally changing as they saw it constitutional doctrine when the constitution itself was about to be amended to enshrine this very principle in it. So why the need to, to interpret the 14th Amendment in this expansive way. At least that was what I think Powell and maybe some of the other justices who agreed with the disposition of the case but didn't sign on to strict scrutiny uh, probably thought. But so that's, I've, I've gone on for a while, but that's a, a little additional color um, on both the backstory and on Frontiero. Yeah, it's great. Um, we, we begin with nothing really. There's no area uh, in which uh, there is an equal protection jurisprudence in, in protecting women. And then almost out of whole cloth through these cases, the Supreme Court starts to come around. Uh, part of it, as I think Kate said, uh, is this interesting strategy that, that she's sometimes, people have questions about, I would say, and maybe even criticized of taking on male litigants. Why defend men? Uh, I might just open that up as a question. Is, and uh, yes, uh, Fatima. And I'm muted, my apologies. <laughs> but it, so one of the things that I think is interesting about that is she's, you know, she's talking at the time fully to a male court. And part of what she so eloquently did was draw out the unfairness of these very routine and, um, and seemingly innocuous rules, but had to do the work of having them see themselves um, in those experiences. So, you know, that, that is a piece of it. But I also think there is a broader notion around uh, gender equality that she consistently over time uh, was drawn to, which, which really is the idea that we are all harmed by these outdated ideas and notions that restrict what it is that we think that it is okay for men to do or for, or for women to do. And sort of illustrating that through male plaintiffs was a really important piece. And it also, and, and I, I know we'll hopefully get a chance to dig into the pregnancy type cases, but it also sort of removes from the table the easy arguments around biological differences. Great. Um, uh, and of course, there are cases involving, um, uh, one famous one involving, uh, which I didn't even know this existed, but, but beer that, but that has a very low alcohol content that, um, that uh, women are able to, to, to drink at, at age 18, but men are not. And, and this is one of the many cases in which she makes those points. Let's move though from thinking about her as a litigator to thinking about 
uh, Justice Ginsburg and her legacy on the court. And I want to ask about what's often thought of as, as her, one of her, her most seminal cases, and that's her opinion in the Virginia Military Institute case. Of course, Virginia Military Institute doesn't allow um, women, and um, there is litigation brought. Now, uh, she and there are uh, cases, of course, that come before this, and many of which she had litigated herself, but now she's on the court. So uh, does she go for her original vision uh, that we talked about in Reed versus Reed, in which she's able to draw an exact analogy between uh, race and gender, or does she, 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 she not do that? And then I'm interested, you know, I don't, I don't think her commitment uh, 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 gets lessened in any way when it comes to um, uh, questions of gender equality. So why, why, if she doesn't, and she doesn't get exactly what she goes for, I think, in Reed versus Reed, uh, why does she go for this lower level of scrutiny in that opinion, intermediate scrutiny? Uh, and how should we understand that uh, in, in a deep way when we're concerned about issues of subordination and, and equality? Uh, and of course, we're going to talk about uh, a lot about race today, I hope, and um, uh, thinking about that analogy might be a way to, to draw us in and disanalogy. So do you want me to say a little bit about the VMI case for those who are unfamiliar? It'd be great if you could introduce it and then say, you know, what she did when it came to these levels of scrutiny. Uh, and of course, that case remains good law. So, so that, that's among her most. So the VMI case was um, decided by the court in 1996, just three years after Justice Ginsburg joined the court as the second female justice. Um, as, as many people will know, and you know, as I lived through this, I was a student at the University of Virginia when this was being litigated, but Virginia maintained an all-male military institute, the Virginia Military Institute. Around 1993, the Citadel, which was sort of a corollary private institution in South Carolina, became co-educational. And once that happened, there was a steady drumbeat of calls for the Virginia Military Institute to similarly co-educate. Um, in fact, I think about 247 applications were filed by women to VMI and they received no answer. The state said nothing, the, the admissions office did nothing with them. And so there was the inevitable lawsuit. Um, the state of Virginia argued that the all male program fostered diversity in educational models, um, having an all male school provided a same sex educational model. And it was good to have diverse models of education in the state. Um, and then they also argued that VMI used what they called an adversative method. And that if women were introduced into the school, the adversative method, which was absolutely integral to the educational program would be irrevocably altered. Um, Virginia lost the suit at the district court level, but interestingly, the district court recommended a remedy. Um, the remedy was the creation of a parallel all women's institute at Mary Baldwin College, the Virginia Women's Institute for Leadership. And so by the time the case made its way to the Supreme Court, there were actually two questions to be answered. One, was the prohibition on women applicants a violation of the Equal Protection Clause and uh, gender-based discrimination? And if it was, was the remedy, um, the creation of an all women's military institute at Mary Baldwin College, was that a sufficient remedy? Was the separate but equal all women's college um, a, a, an appropriate remedy? Um, Justice Ginsburg wrote the case for the court. It's perhaps her most celebrated gender opinion during her time as a jurist on the court. And she answered the first question unequivocally. This was gender-based discrimination. Um, it was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause. And in doing so, she noted the intermediate scrutiny um, standard of review. Again, remember that when she was litigating, there were only two standards of review, rational basis review and strict scrutiny. She'd been pushing for strict scrutiny and ultimately in Craig versus Boren, the court settled on intermediate scrutiny, something in the middle. Um, she took that intermediate scrutiny method, but she sort of added a twist to it. I'm pushing it a little bit further towards strict scrutiny. She used language that had previously been used by Justice O'Connor in a 1982 case, Mississippi University for Women versus Hogan, where Justice O'Connor had said that for the state to uphold a classification based on gender, there had to be an exceedingly persuasive justification. And Justice Ginsburg integrated that particular standard into the standard for intermediate scrutiny. Um, Chief Justice Rehnquist, who had dissented from the opinion in Craig versus Boren, um, identifying intermediate scrutiny as the appropriate level of review for gender-based discrimination, also weighed in here to say that pushing 
exceedingly persuasive justifications into the intermediate scrutiny standard was actually moving the needle towards strict scrutiny in a way that the court's prior jurisprudence did not permit. But it seemed very clear that Justice Ginsburg was being very canny about this. Um, she was not able to get strict scrutiny, but it seemed at least that she had not given up the ghost of it and was really interested in pushing for a heightened level of scrutiny for gender-based classifications. Not sure this was the right strategy. Um, I, I think that many people have questioned it um, in part because one of the things that we have seen over the years around strict scrutiny and race-based classifications is that although race-based classifications are subject to strict scrutiny and that works to eliminate things like segregation or Jim Crow, it can actually be fatal for benign racial classifications like affirmative action policies. And Justice Ginsburg was certainly aware that strict scrutiny could come back and you know, bite you. And so in the Virginia, um, the United States versus Virginia opinion, she actually talks specifically about the fact that the use of a heightened level of review should not preclude the state from taking remedial measures to remedy past discrimination that women had um, experienced in the law. So she's very cognizant of this, but also very much attentive to the idea that some more robust level of scrutiny should apply for race, for gender-based classifications. And she also made clear that a separate but equal institution at Mary Baldwin College was not the same as graduating from Virginia Military Institute. And so she made it very clear that that could not stand a separate but equal facility. And I think she was there 20 years later when that first class of women came back to BMI to celebrate their graduation. Yes, I guess at this point, you know, there's a hope and a risk. There's a hope of achieving um, equality for women uh, when it comes to the law, to resisting discrimination, but also not falling prey to a kind of jurisprudence uh, that might harm women in the way that um, uh, she thought that much of the affirmative action jurisprudence from the court, where this idea of equal protection that had been born of an idea to resist subordination is now used under the guise of color blindness to really undermine civil rights. And then I think that's an area too where Thurgood Marshall is worth mentioning again too, because he really saw in many ways his own legacy, uh, which was an anti-subordination legacy destroyed by a court that emphasized so-called color blindness and, and really struck down uh, fundamental ways in which uh, America could combat uh, racial subordination. Uh, Kate, what do you think, um, and I wanted to ask you about the ERA, was, did she strike the balance in the right way? Did she achieve so much that we don't need an equal rights amendment? Uh, that's an argument, you know, she's, she's not uh, known for uh, her loud rally speeches and going out and, and, and leading marches in the street, but that is happening alongside a lot of these issues. There is an equal rights amendment, it continues to be debated and many continue to push for it. Uh, did she did she um, eliminate the need for it? Is it, it how, did she succeed in 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 crafting the perfect jurisprudence here? Or is there? Um... Well, I'm, I'm, the perfect jurisprudence, of course, is is elusive. Um, but I think I think Melissa's um, sort of read on why um, she may have pulled back when she sort of had the pen and was drafting this majority opinion, and why she may have crafted something that looked different. Of course, you know, sort of where you stand depends in some ways on where you sit. She may have been both concerned about. Um, Kind of a heavy-handed application of strict scrutiny in a way that wasn't sensitive to context and was and it did use this kind of perfect symmetry right looking in the same way at remedial or ameliorative programs as it would uh, at invidious kinds of programs or classifications and and that kind of fear might have caused her to articulate some slightly different standard for, for what it's worth I, I i tend to agree that i'm not sure an exceedingly persuasive justification is really so different from strict scrutiny obviously the formulation is different the substance doesn't feel much uh different to me um but i think that's 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 for sure one reason that she might have hesitated or, or framed uh, the test the way she did um as for the equal rights amendment i mean you know it's it is at, it is now the case that the requisite number of states as of last january or february and i can't remember um but when virginia ratified actually have ratified um the Equal Rights Amendment that um, you know was well on its way to being ratified when these cases were being argued before the court in the early 1970s um, and then ground to a halt in the 1980s and uh, was basically revived in early 2017 um, and has in the last few years seen the remaining four, I guess it is four states actually move forward and ratify. Um, uh, so, so the question is, you know, there are people who think that actually right now the Equal Rights Amendment is a part of the constitution of its own force. Um, the problem is that the Equal Rights Amendment, at least um, both as it was originally drafted, this iteration of it, and um, a piece of legislation extending the deadline, uh, contained within it a deadline that has now 
you know, uh, for just about 40 years uh, ago, right? 82, I guess, is the extended deadline. That deadline has long passed. And so um, now this deadline wasn't in the draft of the amendment. It was in accompanying legislation. So there's an argument that actually that is not binding. And in fact, again, the constitution already contains an equal rights amendment, but I think that's, um, you know, and that th there are cases, I guess, br bringing both the question of whether it is of its own force now law um, or whether, you know, a court might definitively rule that not until Congress, you know, extends the deadline or potentially starts from scratch, can this become part of our constitution and our law. Um, but there is very much an active debate about this uh, right now. I think that both it shaped the development of the jurisprudence in the 1970s. Um, and, you know, to your question of whether it is necessary, I think there is a strong argument that um, despite this, you know, VMI opinion having enshrined within federal law um, a heightened standard of review for laws that distinguish on the basis of sex. Um, there is a lot that an equal rights amendment might still do, um, in part to kind of provide an affirmative warrant to Congress to do things like pass robust legislation um, on issues like pay leave and pregnancy discrimination and, and other sorts of matters um, that maybe the let now now whether you also could have kind of a, a, a robust a more robust cause of action directly under the constitution um, against, you know, maybe private entities, certainly against the government um, is one set of questions, but what else is impacted by the kind of inclusion within the constitution in clear and explicit terms of, an, of a non-discrimination uh, principle? Um, you know, I think that the answer is that it's a lot broader potentially than what kinds of federal claims you might be able to bring to court. Um, and, and arguably there's still, a, not arguably, I think pretty clearly there is still a lot, um, there is still a lot to be done and, and it may be that the Equal Rights Amendment um, has some role in, in moving equality forward outside of the context of just kind of federal lawsuits. Great. Um, uh, I want to move, um, uh, we've been talking about her successes as a litigator, her role uh, in writing this majority opinion in VMI, and now uh, Fatima, I, I want to move to talking about her as a famous dissenter. Of course, that's one reason why she's so celebrated. These dissent collars are, are selling throughout the country. Uh, and I want to talk about two uh, dissents in particular. Uh, with the following question in mind for all of us, what's the point of this practice? And I should just say, for those who don't know what a dissent is, uh, one thing that's unique about the Supreme Court is that um, uh, in opinion writing, even the, the people who don't win, the, the ones who are on the losing side of, of, of the fence, of these um, uh, decisions by nine people, get to say why, what they would have done had they won. They get to write these dissenting opinions. Uh, with an eye partly to uh, maybe being vindicated in the end. And there are some famous dissenters going well back in history, Justice Harlan, uh, for instance, and Plessy versus Ferguson issues a dissent that is now celebrated, even though at the time it was not well regarded. Um, so let me ask about two um, uh, here. One is the uh, dissent in the Ledbetter case. We've been talking about the Constitution. This is a case about a statute, the law. Um, passed by Congress and how to interpret it when it comes to uh, um, uh, certain requirements uh, uh, for deadlines um, uh, uh, and filing uh, complaints uh, under the law. Uh, and the other is uh, we've been talking already, and I'm glad that this has come up naturally, about, the, about questions of race. And, and of course, she dissents as well in the famous Shelby County uh, decision, which we rightly hear a lot about uh, when it comes to the destruction in many ways of the legacy of, of civil rights, uh, voting rights in particular. So I'll just open that up. You know, why dissent and, and what's the significance of the, of the dissents in these two cases? Yeah, I, I think the Ledbetter v. Goodyear case actually uh, illustrates the real power of dissent in a number of ways. Um, you know, that was a case involving a woman named Lily Ledbetter who had worked for almost two decades as one of the only women managers at a tire and rubber plant. And one day someone left in her mailbox a, an anonymous note that listed her salary and then the salary of several other male employees, including the one she supervised. And she saw how much less she was making than them. And so she challenged uh, that uh, pay discrimination under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act 
Um, and ultimately, what the Supreme Court said in an opinion written by Justice Alito uh, was that she filed this claim way too late, that the truth of the matter was she had to have done this within the first 180 days that she was on the job. And, you know, she worked without understanding her wages for almost something like 18 years, right? So it would have set forward this idea that one of your first acts um, would be to prove up that you aren't experiencing pay discrimination, even though employers hold all the information about how their workers are pay, especially at a place like Goodyear, which had one of those rules that you weren't allowed to talk about your pay. Um, so what she did was, you know, you know with her dissent caller, uh, read her dissent from the bench and did it in terms that people understood the deep unfairness of it. And, and as a part of it, she issued a call of, to action to Congress that was more direct than she often did, where she, I think she might have even said the ball is in your court. Um, but that call to action to Congress and the sort of storytelling that was in her dissent helped make what is sometimes sort of what happens in the Supreme Court can feel very far removed from people, but it turned it into this important public conversation around pay and around equal pay. And with Lily Ledbetter herself, the plaintiff in the case being the center of it. And so that dissent both introduced the public to this person, and it also gave a call to action for Congress and movement. But the another reason, uh, and, and Congress followed up within two years, and it became the first law signed by um, President Obama. But the other thing that I would say that is a, a reason for dissent and one that at the National Women's Law Center, I will say, uh, holds deep inspiration for the attorneys on my team. And, and that is the sort of long view that part of why you do you dissent is because you believe that you are right. And you may not, that, they, that may not be recognized today. But over the long haul, the seeds that you plant in that dissent may be lifted up in a, in a range of ways, including by the Supreme Court. Um, and, and in the Shelby County case, she, she so meticulously outlined the absurdity of um, the rule put forward by the Supreme Court. That was a case around section five of the Voting Rights Act, the pre-clearance, the idea that the Department of Justice for certain cities and states had to make a determination if you were gonna change your uh, laws around voting because of a history of discrimination. And she so meticulously explained how absurd it is and, and what the ramifications would be. It is if she is writing the story of 2020 and the election and what it actually looked like when states were changing or not changing during a pandemic, the ways in which people would vote and what the very deep racial uh, disparities that, that came with that. So I, I think each of the reasons, I don't you know, Melissa and Kate, there are probably others, but the one that I say gets us going at the Law Center is because we believe we were right. <laughs> and so we care deeply about that, that's it. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask, I mean, we've talked about her formal dissents in these two cases, but there is a sense in which uh, she also had, you know, as a thinker, a kind of um, critical approach to the court's jurisprudence in a variety of areas, outlining different ways of thinking about things that had uh, over time developed. And of course, as a justice, you're constrained by precedent, but as a thinker, in many ways, she broke out of that. Um, and so I'm going to ask about two areas in which her, her, her thought uh, about how jurisprudence could be shaped if she had her, her way uh, differs uh, from um, the usual way that these things are thought about. And to get more specific, uh, one, I think, and Melissa, I know that you disagree with this from your piece in the Yale Law Review, and I, I certainly agree with you, but one, un, uh, as you say, one unfair kind of criticism of Ruth Bader Ginsburg is that she was insufficiently attentive to the way 
that race and gender intersect. And she was too focused on gender to the exclusion of race. We've already talked about um, uh, her attention to matters of race in cases like Shelby County, but I was hoping that you could say something about that piece and, and the way that her amicus and Coker reveals a more sophisticated way of thinking about the uh, deeply complicated dynamics of race and gender, um, especially when it comes to questions uh, involving the death penalty uh, and, and crimes like rape. And then Kate, I was gonna ask you um, to think about how she would have, if she had her way, uh, have thought about abortion rights jurisprudence from, from the beginning and, and to mention something about this uh, case that she had struck in her comments as uh, really into her time as a justice, she, she would bring them up uh, and how, how struck might have outlined a different way of, of thinking about those matters. So Melissa, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Kate. Sure. Um, so during her career and, and I think right after her passing, there was a lot of commentary about Justice Ginsburg's view on race. Um, one source of criticism was I think her failure to hire clerks of color and specifically African-American clerks. I think she only had one African-American clerk during her entire time as a judge. And I think that is a regrettable blind spot for which she may be fairly critiqued. Um, but in, with regard to her jurisprudence, I, I do think the idea that she is insufficiently attentive to race really does miss the mark. Um, as an initial matter, her whole litigation strategy with the Women's Rights Project, which was to really sort of highlight these men and women who are in many ways gender bending. Sharon Frontiero, who was supporting her husband as a military officer. Um, Steven Weisenfeld, who was, was raising his, his, mother, his motherless son after he was widowed was another one. And so in a way, if you think about um, the way in which African-American women are often the breadwinners in their families or taking on multiple roles, working and um, doing their jobs in the home, it was a jurisprudence, I think, that really did embrace them, even if it did not name them specifically. So on that one level, I think she really is unfairly critiqued as being insufficiently concerned with intersectional concerns of women of color. Another way in which she really very much understood and was attuned to the intersection of race and gender was again in this jurisprudence, which really hasn't received a lot of attention. Um, and it was her response to these death penalty cases. So Coker versus Georgia came up in the wake of Greg versus Georgia and a number of different cases that were challenging the death penalty. And there was a moratorium on the death penalty in the interim period. But this particular case challenged the use of the death penalty as a penalty for the rape of an adult woman. And Justice Ginsburg filed this amicus brief arguing that it should not be a penalty for the rape of an, adult, of an adult woman. And it wasn't that she felt that rape wasn't a sufficiently heinous crime, but that she thought the use of the death penalty underscored the way in which women were understood as, as men's property and that the rape of a woman constituted a property crime either to her husband or to her father. And more specifically, she connected it to the broader use of the criminal law and the criminal justice system against black men for interracial um, intimacy with white women. And she talked about the history of lynching in that brief, the use of um, lynching extra legal violence as well as intra legal violence like the death penalty to punish black men and specifically to police and bound um, their sexuality throughout the South. So. It was, I think, a remarkable brief in a lot of ways. Um, it was not necessarily an expected one from a women's rights organization at that time, but it very much honed in on the way in which racial violence, gender-based discrimination often worked in tandem to be mutually supportive and constitutive. And Kate, uh, how did she help us to, or how did she offer a different way of thinking about abortion rights uh, distinct from the way that the court has 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 thought about it. Um, well, so Corey, you mentioned the Strzok case, which is a case that people probably don't know, and that's because it was never a Supreme Court case, but it was a case that Ginsburg always wished she had had the opportunity to take to the Supreme Court. Um, and I think she believed that the kind of trajectory of our abortion jurisprudence would have been quite different if this case and not Roe versus Wade had been the first abortion, the first big abortion case to make it to the Supreme Court. So basically the backstory here is that this is another case involving a woman in the military a captain named Susan Strzok in the Air Force, she became pregnant. And Air Force policy at the time uh, required um, either a mandatory discharge of women in service who became pregnant or an abortion. Um, so this was um, an abortion subsidized by the military, right, by the government. Um, 
uh, or the you know, termination of the position, um, but not an opportunity to continue in service and to carry a pregnancy to term. And Strzok didn't want to have an abortion and she didn't want to give up her job. Um, so she carried the pregnancy to term and she gave birth and she gave the child up for adoption. And then she challenged the policy um, and she lost um, in the district court and in the ninth circuit um, and Ginsburg desperately wanted to take this case to the Supreme Court um, and uh, filed a brief in the Supreme Court. The case actually had a cert petition, um, maybe not a merits brief, maybe just a cert petition, but had filed a petition. Um, but while that petition was pending, uh, the military um, at the behest of the Solicitor General, Erwin Griswold, changed the policy, um, you know, reinstated struck and thus mooted the case. Um, but I think she believed that it would have been, because this was a case featuring a woman who wanted to continue rather than terminate a pregnancy, um, it would have allowed um, the court to sort of understand that reproductive autonomy, that the choice to continue a pregnancy and have a family and the choice to terminate a pregnancy are essentially inseparable and two sides of the same coin and the exercise of coercive authority by the state, whether in the service of the continuation of a pregnancy or the termination of a pregnancy are, are functionally indistinguishable or at least basically the same kind of coercive state sort of exercise of state power. Um, and also that this was a kind of pregnancy discrimination um, in addition to um, you know, an invasion of reproductive autonomy. And so it sort of linked up the ideas of autonomy and liberty and equality um, in a way that she, you know, whether or not she would have been successful in getting the Supreme Court to write a decision that looked the way her brief did, I think is a separate question. Um, but it presented the same issues um, as Roe did in, in a very different posture. Um, and, you know, where Roe ended up really grounding the abortion right in privacy um, and really focusing on the right of the physician as opposed to the, to the woman, although that is you know, somewhat changed in intervening abortion cases, um, you know, the right would have been articulated, uh, she hoped in very different ways if Strzok had ever made it before the Supreme Court. Um, so, so I think that's, that's one answer. And you know, in terms of what the, the cases that she had um, while on the court, um, you know, her dissent in Gonzalez versus Carhartt, which is the case in which the court upheld the federal so-called partial birth abortion ban act, um, was, you know, her most famous, I would say, abortion writing as a justice. Um, you know, it very much does represent a, a vision of the sort of the, the right to control reproductive destiny um, that looks much more like her struck brief than the court's opinion in Roe versus Wade uh, or even in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Um, but, you know, I, it situates itself in that the, the, the line of cases that sort of begins with Roe. And so I'm not sure it's possible to start over in the same way that she could have done um, if she had been writing on a blank slate. Yeah, it's one thing to have ideas. It's another thing to be a member of a court that has a long tradition and precedent and, and put together um, uh, jurisprudence. Uh, so uh, I did want to, of course, ask about Bush v. Gore, and I'll come back to it if there's time, but I also want to uh, ask um, the question that Liam has put into the chat. I'll just mention Bush v. Gore because it might be on people's mind. This was a case in which even though Justice Ginsburg did so much on behalf of the Equal Protection Clause, she said there, uh, this is a fake Equal Protection Clause argument. You're trying to use the Equal Protection Clause uh, for the purpose of uh, basically throwing the election uh, uh, to George Bush in, in a way that's inappropriate. And uh, we've never done this before, by the way. So it's an odd case uh, in many ways because she's, she's resisting the expansion of the Equal Protection Clause. And Justice Scalia, um, I think, uh, disingenuously is trying to expand it, um, uh, uh, joining an opinion, expanding it. So we could come back to it, but Liam, uh, asked a question, um, which is, uh, uh, he, he refers to the so-called Ginsburg rule. I think that's absolutely right. I don't think there was a Ginsburg rule, but he wants to use that question to ask more generally, how do we get away from this thing that's been uh, used to, uh, in, in Ruth Bader Ginsburg's name to limit the ability of, uh, uh, of um, uh, in, in Supreme Court nominations of the public and the Senate to find out about the philosophy, the views of Supreme Court justices. So is there a Ginsburg rule? And if not, um, you know, what can we do to better inform the public about uh, the views of justices compared to the, well, I'll just throw my, I'm trying to be neutral, but the travesty <laughs> that was uh, the, the last couple of hearings that we saw. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know if there is actually a Ginsburg, if there ever was actually a Ginsburg rule. And certainly the telling of the Ginsburg rule um, the, the story of the Ginsburg rule is that she answered hardly any 
questions at all when the truth of the matter is she actually answered all sorts of questions in, in far greater detail um, and, um, and far more understanding, especially around the area of privacy, which is a, a space where there seems to be a, a, um, a hyper adherence to this rule that doesn't exist. But what we saw in the last uh, hearing of Justice Amy Coney Barrett is almost a, a new rule. So maybe it's the Coney Barrett rule at this point. And, and that new rule is if I disagree, I really can't say anything about it. And I'm, I'm being a little bit glib here, but I say it in part because we saw a refusal to um, even align and answer questions around things like Griswold or even do the sorts of things that we saw everyone from Justice Thomas to Justice Roberts do in terms of questions being asked. You know, um, the, the incoming president has said that there will be a, a commission, right, that looks at, uh, at, at judges more broadly and courts more broadly, I think, you know, what will that commission's mandate is, is a little unclear, but if I have my druthers, part of what that commission should be doing is looking um, at some of the, the big questions that have been put on the table in the political cam of the last couple of years, but also how that this other meta question around how is it that we determine who our judges are and what level of information do we expect to know about them? And that is a question, not just for the Supreme Court, it's a question for all of our lower courts. Um, you know, it's a question uh, that many people have been concerned about because it's not just at the Supreme Court hearings that were, which get a lot of attention where people aren't answering any questions that are important. Um, we're seeing this with district court and court of appeal nominees as well. Um, maybe I'll just say two quick things. I mean, one, I think Fatima is totally right. There, there, the Gins, Ginsburg was totally forthcoming in a backward looking way about the court's cases, right? And so when Barrett continually invoked this Ginsburg rule to say no hints, no previews, that was, there was some truth to it, which is that Ginsburg did say that. And she was careful not to preview her her views on cases, specific cases or matters that might come before the court, but she was very open um, in her position about, you know, cases that the court had already decided and general principles of law. And I think that's just an important distinction that the senators didn't really press her on. So I think that that it is true that the last few confirmation hearings, and especially the most recent one, um, have been you know, remarkably uninformative about the nominees. But I think a big part of the fault there lies with the senators on the Judiciary Committee who failed really to press them or to grasp the distinction um, and thus allow the nominees and particularly Justice Barrett to get away with saying virtually nothing even about really well-settled law, right? So Fatima mentioned Griswold, right? Nominees have historically been willing to say that Griswold versus Connecticut, uh, which, you know, protects the right of married couples to use contraception was correctly decided. And it was really striking that she wouldn't even uh, agree with that really uncontroversial proposition. And there were a lot of other examples like that. So yeah. I think Senator- But she need did agree with Brown. And so it is, uh, it, it actually, it would be one thing if she said, I can tell you about no decision of any time in history, I just refuse. But she said, well, I'll tell it here because that is so clearly well decided and not likely to come before me. But, but Griswold seems like maybe it's on the table. I have uh, one last question from, uh, that's relevant actually to this discussion from Julia Livingston. We've got about four minutes before we, uh, we have to say goodbye to everyone. So I'll just uh, read it. Uh, Julia Livingston wants to know, I'll just uh, read it to you. She says, uh, what do you make of the administration and the Senate comparing a Amy Coney Barrett and her career with RBGs? Do you think they were uh, successful? I think this was a very calculated strategy. And to be clear, it wasn't simply just in what was said at the confirmation hearings, the entire setup was sort of a theater of mimicry. Um, the Rose Garden ceremony was purposefully um, modeled on the same Rose Garden ceremony that Bill Clinton had used to introduce Ginsburg as his nominee in 1993, right down to the flags that were behind the dais. Um, during the 
confirmation hearings, there was just, again, this sort of idea of like sort of framing now Justice Barrett as sort of a latter day Ginsburg, but also highlighting their differences. Justice Ginsburg came to the court when her children were grown and gone from her household, whereas it was emphasized that Amy Coney Barrett was um, the mother of a sizable American family, to use the words of then Vice President Michael Pence. Um, so, so I think there were ways in which they were consciously evoking this idea of women, you know, one woman out, one woman in, but, you know, also highlighting that there were a lot of differences in these women. Um, some of these differences, I think, were aimed at the Republican base, specifically that this was a woman who, unlike Justice Ginsburg, would probably have a very different view of reproductive rights, one that was likely informed by her own experiences, um, raising a family of seven children, um, two of whom had been adopted from Haiti and one of whom had Down syndrome. Um, I think it's very relevant when you think about the cases that are currently percolating in the lower federal courts where um, we have a lot of challenges to abortion restrictions that uh, prohibit women from aborting if there is a question of either race selection, sex selection, or um, terminating a pregnancy for the purpose of avoiding a disability. Um, again, I think there's a way in which if a case like that comes before the court, a Justice Barrett will have a kind of epistemic authority um, to speak on it in the same way that Justice Ginsburg would have had an epistemic authority as a woman to combat assaults on the right to abortion. So I think it was all incredibly calculated, some of it aimed at the general public, but a lot of it aimed at the base specifically. Uh, great. Uh, we're unfortunately out of time. I feel like we could go another four hours, no problem. Um, uh, and I just want to thank uh, all of our panelists, uh, uh, the attendees, um, and uh, I thought this was a great session and a great tribute uh, to an amazing litigator and an amazing Supreme Court justice. Uh, and uh, it is a tough time right now, and um, there's a question about the stability of liberal democracy of our constitution, but she offers a way forward. Uh, so thanks for bringing that out to our three panelists and to our organizers and to all of you uh, for joining us. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone.